let us pray almighty god we thank you for bringing us together once again for the bible study tonight we thank you because of how you have opened the scriptures to us since we came to this church and we thank you because you affirm and confirm every time that in reality in truth and indeed this is a bible believing church and as a bible believing church you always lead us to study the word in depth and father we pray that this privilege you have granted us as a church will never be taken away from us in jesus name this is a great privilege a great opportunity to have the spirit of god so fill us so that it will instruct us in every part of the word because this actually is the evidence that we have the spirit of god that the spirit of truth is leading us into all truth every time we come to you lord we pray that as we've been rejoicing together in all that you are teaching us and leading us to study in your word we pray that the privilege will continually be ours in jesus name we thank you for the new series we have begun in the bible and father we thank you for how you blessed us in such a mighty way last week monday we're praying that today again you'll be mightily present with us to enlighten to instruct to lead and to guide us into the truth of your word in jesus name where there is darkness or confusion we pray that the light of truth the light of your word the light from christ will dispel and drive away all darkness and confusion in jesus name we pray lord that where there is ignorance that as your truth will come in in a very clear direct powerful manner father we pray that all our ignorance you will drive away in jesus name give us O oh lord hearts to understand ears to hear eyes to see and the courage to arise and follow through once we see the word of god we bless on him because we know you have answered we pray lord that as we get into the word now we'll discover deep truth wondrous things out of your word for our lives in jesus name we thank you because we know you have answered in jesus name we pray Today we come to the second study of our new series in the study of the Bible for this year. And we're studying from Genesis chapter 2, verses 1 through to 25. This chapter is a detailed explanation of some of the accounts already given in the first chapter. I need to tell you from the very beginning that this second chapter of the Bible is not a separate account of creation written by another writer. As I explained to you last week, the whole book of Genesis was written by Moses, inspired of God. And I told you that this whole book, as well as the whole Bible, is given to us by inspiration from God. And it is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that you, the child of God, may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. And yet there has been much confusion in the minds of many people who are not well instructed in Scripture concerning this chapter, chapter 2, that we are studying today. Such confusion arises because of their neglect what are they neglecting they're neglecting the fact that this account of the creation that we read of in chapter 2 only particularly explains to us the aspect relating to the creation of man by god as you look at this whole chapter many things will strike you from the very beginning the chapter enlightens us on the sabbath of rest after the creation of all things and then it goes on to tell us how the earth or the whole world at that time was maintained in particular how the dew will come upon the surface and then wet everything so that 
the grass, the trees, and all vegetation will continue to grow. And then we have a particular account of the formation, the creation of man. And our man became a living soul. Then we have the provision and the description of the Garden of Eden for the care of man, for his convenience and comfort as well. Then we read of the law that God gave unto man in a state of innocence and perfection. Then the creation of the woman came, came in, and then the marriage of the first man and the first woman, and the institution of the marriage ordinance. That, in brief, is what we have in Genesis chapter 2, which we want to look into in details today. As usual, we have divided the whole chapter into three parts so that we can conveniently study each part and understand the whole revelation we are being given in this chapter. Part 1, the description of man's creation. Part 2, man in the garden of Eden. And part 3, the man, the woman, and the institution of marriage. Let's now look at it from chapter 2, reading from verse 1. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the hosts of them. And on the seventh day, God ended his work, which he had made, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work, which he had made. And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because that in it he had rested from all his work, which God created and made. Verse 4. These are the generations of the heavens and of the earth, when they were created, in the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens, and every plant of the field, before it was in the earth, and every herb of the field before it grew. For the Lord God had not caused it to rain upon the earth, and there was not a man to till the ground. But there went up a mist from the earth and watered the whole face of the ground. Verse 7 And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living soul in this first part of the chapter that we're studying we see the crown of god's creation that is the creation of man and in verse 7 we have that account the detailed account of how god actually created man that the lord god formed man out of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And then man became a living soul. From verse 1, we see that when God finished the work, then we are told on the seventh day he rested. This chapter begins by telling us that God finished what he had begun. I think that is very important for every one of us to take note of. Look at the wide old world and look at how extensive how deep how great the work of the creation of the whole universe would have been but the joy we have is that whatever god begins to do however great however extensive however far-reaching whatever god begins to do he is able to finish think about that for a moment maybe god has started a work in your own life and God has begun to do something through us. We know that what he has started through us is able to finish through us. Never forget that. If God has started a good thing, if God has begun a good thing, heaven and earth may pass away. But we know that the power of God, the purpose of God, the plan of God will never pass away. He will finish whatever he has begun. As he saved you, he's able to carry you to the end. As he begun the work of grace in you, is able to carry that work on. Then we're told that at the end of the first six working days, God sees from all the works 
of creation. And then we're told the eternal God rested. How do you understand that? Look at that. Look at verse 2. And on the seventh day, God ended his work, which he had made. And he rested on the seventh day from all his work, which he had made. Now, you know that God wasn't resting because he got tired. A person can rest because he's tired. But as a human being, God is eternal. God is all-powerful. And therefore, his rest was not because of weariness or because of tiredness. Why then did he rest? Number one, because he had accomplished what he purposed. And he had seen that everything that he had made was very good. Because he had accomplished what he purposed in his mind, because of that, he rested. Not only that, is to teach us a lesson that we, as children of God, we will have time to rest. Time to look over all that has been done. But then I'll come back to that later. The lesson we learned from this, I've told you, is that one day in seven, one day in seven days, we will have time to rest. Time to look over all that has been done during the week. Time to take inventory. Time to evaluate how we're leading our lives. And that time will be the time to seek the grace of God. If there is anything that had been wrong during the week, anything that had not been well done, anything that we need more of the grace of God, anything that we need more of the favor of God, it is that day, one in seven, that we will call upon the Lord. And then he will be able to give us more grace for the week ahead of us. For the children of Israel, they were pointedly very clearly told that their day of rest and worship will be on the seventh day. That's Saturday. In Exodus chapter 31. Exodus chapter 31. From verses 16 and 17. Wherefore, the children of Israel shall keep the Sabbath. I want you to notice that in particular. Therefore, the children of Israel, not the Gentiles, shall keep the Sabbath to observe the Sabbath throughout their generations for a perpetual covenant. It is a sign between me and the children of Israel forever. Notice that again. It is a sign between the Almighty God and the children of Israel. Not between God and the Gentiles, but between God and the children of Israel forever. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, and on the seventh day he rested and was refreshed. Now for us today, when do we have that day of rest? And that day that we worship the Lord and we take inventory of our lives, look at all that we have done, receive more grace from the Lord, so that we have strength to face the task ahead. Let's look at Acts of the Apostles, chapter 20, verse 7. And upon the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul preached unto them, ready to depart on the morrow, and continued a speech until midnight. For us in the new covenant, for us who are the new creation, for us now who have been reconciled unto God the Father through the Lord Jesus Christ. You know that the new creation and the new covenant was eventually finalized on the first day of the week when Christ rose from the dead. And so for us, it is that first day of the week that has become the day of rest and the day of worship, the day of prayer, the day of receiving more grace from the Lord. The day of preparing for that eternal rest that we're looking for. In 1 Corinthians chapter 16. 1 Corinthians chapter 16 verses 1 and 2. Now, concerning the collection for the saints. As I have given order to the churches of Galatia. Even so do ye. Upon the first day of the week. Let every one of you lay by him in store. As God has prospered him that there be no gatherings when I come here Paul the apostle emphasized it and he said this was not only for the church at Corinth 
but for all the churches of the Gentiles, all the churches of Galatia in particular. And he said, on the first day of the week, the week has ended on Saturday, and you have done your work until Saturday, and in appreciation to God, in gratitude to God, with thanksgiving unto God, you now come unto the Lord, and you lay by you in store what you will give in offering unto the Lord. But then, this goes beyond just resting on Sunday, resting on the first day of the week. You know, the apostle stretches it, and now he tells us this is very important. You know, this world is a time for us to labor. It's a time for us to work. And then Paul the Apostle in writing to the Hebrews emphasized this. He said, after this period of labor, looking at the whole of life as a week of labor, a period of labor, a period where we run here, we run here, we run there, because you see actually this world is a period and a time of sweating, of laboring, and eating out of the sweat of the brow. And then as you finish, you enter into its rest. And the apostle says now there is a rest abiding for the children of God. And for you to get into that eternal rest, you have to get into the spiritual rest even here. Which is a symbol, a symbol of the real sanctification experience. Look at Hebrews chapter 4. Hebrews chapter 4 verse 1. Let us therefore fear, lest a promise be left us of entering into his rest any of you should seem to come short of it. It says, let us therefore fear, let us tremble before the Lord, lest after God has left a promise for us that we will enter into his rest. Any of you should seem to come short of it. You know that this rest goes beyond resting on Sunday or resting on Saturday or resting during the holidays here on earth. It's talking about having another kind of rest. After this whole life of labor would have finished. Now in verse 3. For we which have believed do enter into rest. As he said, as I have sworn in my wrath, if they shall enter into my rest, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. It says, we who have believed, already we have entered into a kind of spiritual rest. No more struggling against sin. As if we have been overcome, overpowered every time. He has given us that soul resting, that heart resting. He has given us that peace in our soul, that peace in our heart. And now we can rest in the Lord. And then he says, for he says, He spake in a certain place of the seventh day on this wise. And God did rest the seventh day from all his work. And now he says in verse 5, And in this place again, if they shall enter into my rest, seeing therefore it remaineth some, that some must enter therein, and they to whom it was first preached, entered not in because of unbelief. That is, they couldn't enter in, into that perfect rest, because of unbelief. If we are going to enter in, we'll have to enter in, by faith, from verse 9, there remaineth therefore a rest to the people of God. That's spiritual rest. That's a future rest. And it is for the people of God. For he that is entered into his rest, he also has ceased from his own works, as God did from his. Let us labor. Let us endeavor therefore to enter into that rest, lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. So then, we learn from God that after this world, this earthly labor has ended, we can enter into a particular rest with the Lord. Let's go back to Genesis chapter 2. Genesis chapter 2, verse 3. And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it and set it apart, because that in it, he had rested from all his work, which God created and made. Now verse 4. And these are the generations of the heavens and the earth. When they were created in the day that God made the earth and the heavens. And every plant of the field before it was in the earth. 
and every herb of the field before it grew. For the Lord had not caused it to rain upon the earth, and there was not a man to till the ground. And there went up a mist from the earth, and watered the whole face of the ground. There were told the method by which God kept the vegetation, that is, the field, the forest, before it began to rain. God ordered everything, and he brought in the right thing at the right time, at the time he himself had appointed. We're told that before man was available to till the ground, now it's talking about the whole earth, because you know Adam alone, could not till even all the whole earth. And therefore God had a way of taking care of the whole earth even at such a time. In Psalm 65. Psalm 65 from verse 9. Thou visited the earth and waterest it. Thou greatly enrichest it with the river of God, which is full of water. Thou preparest them corn. When thou hast provided for it, when thou hast so provided for it, thou waterest the ridges thereof abundantly. Thou settlest the furrows thereof. Thou makest it soft with showers. Thou blessest the springing thereof. Thou crownest the year with thy goodness, and thy paths drop fatness. All that is talking about how God waters the whole earth. And how God himself refreshes everywhere, everything, that it will bring forth food for the people on the face of the earth. In Psalm 135, verse 7, He causes the vapors to ascend from the ends of the earth. He maketh lightnings for the rain. He bringeth the wind out of his treasuries. All these are the work of God. And God himself has continued to sustain the whole earth. Now, let's uh, learn a lesson once again. You know, the reason why we're studying all this is so that we can learn from the actions of God every time. Whenever something, when you see what God made, he took care of what he made. And whatever he has given us to, he wants us to take care of everything so that it will remain fresh. It will continue to grow. It will continue to bear fruit. And before the rain came, God made sure that he had, he had the dew and the mist that watered the face of the earth. Let's now go back to Genesis chapter 2, verse 7. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And man became a living soul. Here we have the particular account of the creation of man. And we see the two parts. One, God formed man of the dust of the ground. That's one part. Then the second part, God breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. Something coming out of the eternal God himself. And man became a living soul. A never dying soul. A soul that will live forever. That is, even after the body has packed up, after the soul has departed out of the body, that soul will continue to live, will continue to remain in existence. It came from God. And that means man actually is a never dying soul. But let's look at this part by part. First, to see that the body came out of the dust. Today, biologists have confirmed this same scripture. They tell us that the 16 or more basic elements of which man's body is composed all came out of the dust. That's exactly the confirmation of scripture. But let's see from many other scriptures what we have. For example, in Genesis chapter 3 verse 19. In the sweat of thy face shall thou eat bread till thou return to the ground for out of it was thou taken out of the ground was thou taken for dust thou art and unto dust 
thou shalt return. You see very clearly there that God formed man out of the dust of the ground. Verse 23. Therefore, the Lord God sent him forth from the garden of Eden to till the ground from whence he was taken. To till the ground from whence it was taken. So then you see that God created man of the dust of the ground. In Job chapter 33. Job chapter 33. Verse 6. Behold, I am according to thy wish in God's stead. I also am formed out of the clay. I told you last week that there are some people that say they do not believe Genesis. Especially the first few chapters of Genesis. But they say they believe the rest of the Bible. And I told you, you cannot say you do not believe Genesis and then you believe the rest of the Bible. You know why? All the rest of the Bible, they confirm the account in Genesis. You can see there that all the, what were read in Job affirms and confirms that man was made out of the doors. Psalm 103. Psalm 103 verse 14. For he knoweth our frame. He remembereth that we are dust. He remembereth that we are dust. Once again, that's the truth there. Ecclesiastes chapter 12 verse 7. Ecclesiastes chapter 12 verse 7. Then shall the dust return to the earth as it was, and the spirit shall return unto God who gave it. The dust will return to the dust. That is, the body will return back to the dust from where it was taken. And then the spirit will return unto God. That means really, the spirit is a treasure that we have. Have you ever thought about it? That actually the body will become just a worthless, useless, loathsome carcass if the soul did not animate it. That is the moment that the spirit, the soul, will get out of the body. All that remains will just be the worthless, useless, loathsome carcass because the spirit has gone out. The real treasure in us is the spirit of God we have. All the, the body is described as the earthen vessel. That is the vessel of clay, the vessel of dust, the vessel of earth. In 1 Corinthians chapter 4. For 2 Corinthians rather. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Reading from verse 7. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels. We have this treasure in earthen vessels. That the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. So then we have learned that the body is, was made out of the doors. But we also read in Genesis chapter 2 verse 7. Let's look at it again. Genesis chapter 2 verse 7. That God breathed into his nostrils and the breath of life. And man became a living soul. Man became a living soul. In Job chapter 27, Job chapter 27 and in verse 3, All the while my breath is in me, the Spirit of God is in my nostrils. You know what he means? He said, I'm alive because God breathed into me the breath of life. And it's just referring to how God created Adam. You will see that scripture supports scripture. Scripture explains scripture. And scripture interprets scripture. That's the best way to study the Bible. Do not allow a false teacher, a false prophet, just to be giving you his own ideas. Or just to be giving you his own suppositions. Or just to be giving you his own suggestions. And say, I feel, I think, in my opinion. No, we don't need any opinion. We just need the word of God to confirm the word of God. The word of God to interpret and to explain the word of God. Then look at Job chapter 33. Verse 4. The spirit of God has made me. And the breath of the Almighty has given me life. It's a confirmation of what God has done. The Spirit of the Almighty 
or the breath of the Almighty has given me life. Even though it had been some years since the creation of man, yet this man, that is Job, affirmed that it was still the Spirit of God and the breath coming from him that kept Job alive. Zechariah chapter 12. Zechariah chapter 12 verse 1. The burden of the word of the Lord for Israel, says the Lord, which stretcheth forth the heavens, and layeth the foundation of the earth. Look at this. And formeth the spirit of man within him. Formeth the spirit of man within him. And then in the New Testament in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verse 45. So and so it is written. The first man Adam was made a living soul. The first man Adam was made a living soul and the last adam was made a quickening spirit so then today we have learned concerning the creation of man one we have learned that god made everything we have learned that what he began he finished and today we need to learn from that that what god has begun is also able to finish but i have a question for you before we go on does God still work today? Or is he forever resting? Because it says in Genesis chapter 2, verses 1 to 3, that God rested from his works. Does that mean now that God is forever resting? He does not do any kind of work anymore. Well, you will need to understand that what that passage is saying, that he rested from the work of creation. He's still at work today. His only begotten son tells us about that. In John chapter 5 verse 17. John chapter 5 verse 17. But Jesus answered them, My father walketh hitherto, and I walk. Jesus Christ said, My father is still at work. And also he says, I walk. So then the Lord is still at work. And he's still at work spiritually. You know what the Bible says? Concerning those disciples, it says, They went and he preached the word. Then it says, God walking with them. God walking with them. Confirming the word with signs following. God is still at work today. In Ephesians chapter 1, verse 11. In whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated according to the purpose of him, the purpose of who? The purpose of him who walketh all things after the counsel of his own will. The Lord is still at work today. In fact, if you are born again, that is the evidence of the continuing work of God. In Ephesians chapter 2 verse 10. For we are, in, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God has before ordained that we shall walk in them. You see, every time somebody is born again, it's an evidence that God is at work. Every time there is a new creation, sins are forgiven, lives are changed, hearts are transformed, souls are renewed. Every time the grace of God comes into the life of a man and God turns him around and does a supernatural work of grace in him, it's an evidence that God is still at work. Are you born again? Are you a child of God? Are your sins forgiven? Have you become a new creation? Are you not living a new life? Is God supplying grace uh, into your life every day so you can fulfill the responsibilities of every day? That's the evidence God is still at work. For where is workmanship? Created in Christ Jesus. Those are new creatures. Unto good works which God has before ordained that we shall walk in them. Also, we have learned that you see, the, actually, the most important part of man is the spirit, is the soul. You know how many people will concentrate taking care of the body, feeding the body, and they never do anything about their soul, and yet it is a soul, the never dying soul, that will go in the presence of God on the final day. And you know, if you are not taking care of your soul, you have not been born again, you should think about this that this body you are thinking about one day one day the spirit will come out of it and then the body will just become a carcass will just become ordinary clay again to be dumped back into the earth 
Why are you not wise and take care of your soul? In James chapter 2, verse 26. For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead. What are we supposed to do? Does that mean to neglect the body? I didn't say that. I said as we're taking care of the body, we should take care of the soul. Then we ought to understand that the body came out of the hands of God. And the spirit also was given by God. You know what that teaches us? It teaches us to offer back unto God. Offer back unto God what came from him number one concerning your body in romans chapter 12 verses 1 and 2 i beseech you therefore brethren by the mercies of god that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice holy acceptable unto god which is your reasonable service you see that since your body came from the lord the lord created your body he created your body for his own glory. He used it for the glory of God. He created your body so that you can present it to him. Holy sacrifice, living sacrifice, acceptable sacrifice unto God. Now, verse 2, and be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and the perfect will of God. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Verses 19 and 20. Watch. Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? That body was made by God, created by God. Therefore, it's a property belonging to God. Therefore, you should not mess up with that body. You should not do evil with that body. And you should not allow any immorality in that body glorify God in your body look at verse 20 for you are bought with a price therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit which are God's which are that means both parts belong unto God your body belongs to God glorify God with your body your spirit your soul belongs to God glorify God with your spirit and with your soul now we want to go to the second part this is man in the garden of eden let's go to genesis chapter 2 genesis chapter 2 verse 8 and the lord god planted a garden eastward in eden and there he put the man whom he had formed here we are told god planted a garden eastward in eden and there he put Adam, whom he had made, whom he had formed. It was the description of the Garden of Eden. What do we learn about this Garden of Eden? From verse 9. And out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life also in the midst of the garden and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And a river went out of Eden to water the garden. And from thence it parted and became into four heads. The name of the first is Python. That is, that, that is it which compasses the whole earth of Avila. The whole land of Avila. There is the gold. And the gold of that land is good. There is Delium and Onyx Stone. The name of the second river is Gihon. The same is it that compasses the whole of the land of Ethiopia. And the name of the third river is Hidekel. That is it which goeth toward the east of Ish of Assyria. And the fourth river is Euphrates. And the Lord God took the man and put him into the garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it as we look at the description of the garden of eden we see that this garden was a work of god's wisdom god's love god's power he had created man and then he made this garden for him eden eden in the original language signifies delight and pleasure therefore as we say the garden of eden we mean the garden of delight the garden of pleasure the trees in the garden were the best and the choicest. 
the rivers which watered the garden contributed much both to the pleasantness and the, fruitless, the fruitfulness of the garden. The gardening are two extraordinary trees peculiar to itself. On earth there were not their like. There was the tree of life in the midst of the garden, nowhere else on earth to be found. And there was also the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Adam, in his innocence and in his perfection, was put in that garden. He was put in that garden not to be idle, but to dress the garden and to keep that garden. None of us is sent into this world to be idle. Whatever God has given us needs care. It needs care. Now, let us learn some things from what God has done here. One, we we'll see that God is a God of love. God of wisdom. Some people, when you invite them to come to the Lord, they say, No, I don't want to come to Jesus Christ. I don't want to become a Christian. I don't want to come to the Lord. Why? Well, because if I come to the Lord, He will destroy my joy. No, not at all. The intention of God, the purpose of God is that you will have joy, you will have pleasure, you will have something good from the sight, from the presence of the Lord. Only that it will not be a kind of pleasure that will feed your lust, that will feed your corruption, that will make your fallen nature to be rejoicing in evil. It will be the joy, the kind of joy that can come from the presence of God. Therefore, we know that when we come to God, God will do everything that is necessary, everything that he ought to do to make us full of joy. His love will not make our lives miserable. His love will make our lives pleasant. His love will make our life enjoyable in a very beautiful and holy manner. Then we are told that in that garden, there was the tree of life. If Adam had been wise, if Adam had kept the law of God, he would have taken that tree of life. He would have lived. He would have lived and lived forever. Lived forever in obedience to the word of God. He would have been able to enjoy all that God had provided. But eventually he lost that opportunity. And he had to be driven out of that garden of Eden. So that he will not put forth his hand to touch the tree of life in his falling nature. In his falling condition. And then we learn that the water watered the garden. And then we're told that outside that garden, we're told concerning Ethiopia, Assyria, we're told concerning river Euphrates, and we're told concerning the places where uh, there is gold. But you know, you cannot compare the tree of life with gold. You might say in the garden, you wouldn't find so much gold, but you find there the tree of life. That's something we learn today, you know. In the kingdom of God, we have Christ who is our life. In the world, they may have gold. And the Bible says in one of these verses that the gold is good. Verse 12. And the gold of that land is good. And the gold in the world, actually, gold is good. And all the riches of the world, all that is good. But eternal life is better. Eternal life is better. If you have Jesus Christ, you have the life of God. If you have Jesus Christ, you have eternal life. Appreciate what God has given unto you. And then in this garden, man was not to be idle. Verse 15, the Lord God took the man and put him into the garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. To dress it and to keep it. Some people erroneously think that if it were not because Adam sinned, we will not be walking at all. We will be idle all the day long. There will be nothing to do. We just wake up and eat and sleep and wake up and sleep and eat and wake up and eat and sleep again. Nothing like that. Even in the state of innocence, in the state of perfection, before sin ever came in, God told the man to dress the garden and to keep the garden. To dress the garden and to keep the garden. And so we learn today that we ourselves should not remain idle. That's what we're learning from the word of God. That if Adam, before you sin, was not to remain idle, we too who are now children of God, we must not remain idle. In Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. Reading from verse 28. 
Let him that stole steal no more. But rather let him labor. Let him labor. Walking with his hands the thing that is good. That he may have to give to him that needeth. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 3 verse 12. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3 verse 12. Now, them that are such we command. And exhort by our Lord Jesus Christ that with quietness they work and eat their own bread. With quietness they work and eat their own bread. Romans chapter 12 and verse 11. God doesn't want us to be idle now that we're children of God. Not slothful in business, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. You can serve the Lord, but you ought to work. You must not remain idle. You know, sometimes some people will say, God has spoken to them. They should not work at all. God has spoken to them that they are to be rising up and sleeping and eating. God has spoken to them that if they did any work, then God will punish them because God doesn't want them to use their certificate. is an excuse for laziness. God wants man to work. He wants you to work because if you do not work, how are you going to eat? He doesn't want you begging. He doesn't want you going around depending upon people saying, God met me, gave me a dream, gave me a vision, spoke to my ears. I shouldn't work. Arise and work. If you are a man, you are a woman, you have two hands, you have two feet, and your body is complete, arise and work. God wants you to work. Every day go to your work. And then on the day of the Lord, you can come and just give thanks unto the Lord. And rest for that one day. In Psalm 104. Psalm 104 verse 23. Man goeth forth into his work and to his labor until the evening. You see that? Man goeth to his labor. And he works and he labors until the evening. Let's go back to Genesis chapter 2. Genesis chapter 2. When God placed Adam in the garden of Eden. He gave him a law, a law to regulate his life, a law to test his obedience. Because you see, man is a free moral agent and God will not force obedience. God will rather make you show that you love him, that you want to honor him, that you appreciate him by keeping the watch of God. Let's now go to Genesis chapter 2, reading from verse 17. Why don't we start from verse 16? And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die. God placed the man in the garden of Eden. Then he gave him a charge, a commandment, and he told him the condition whereby he will remain alive, alive in fellowship with God. But then he said, if he contradicted the word of God, if he disobeyed the word of God, on the day he did that, he will surely die. Adam's privilege of remaining in the Garden of Eden and of enjoying the good things bestowed upon him depended upon one thing and what is that implicit obedience unquestioning obedience continual obedience to the word of god and that's the same condition today if you are going to enjoy the promises of god if you are going to retain god's favor in your life if the christian experiences of being born again the christian experience of being a child of god the Christian experience of being sanctified, baptized in the Holy Ghost, is going to remain in your life. There's only one condition. The same condition God gave to Adam. Implicit obedience. Continuing obedience. And unquestioning obedience to the word of God. God's promises are obtained and God's promises are maintained by meeting the condition of doing whatsoever the Lord has said. Let's look at this uh, commandment that it passed over also unto the woman when the woman became, uh, when the woman was created as well. Genesis chapter 3 from verse 1. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. 
and said unto the woman, Yea, had God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree, which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. So then you can see the commandment of the Lord giving unto them we learn something that disobedience against the commandment of god carries a penalty and it is the death penalty now death mentioned here is separation from god separation from the favor of god uh, you know see every time we mention death some people might think that it, it means uh, going into the grave well that is physical death Look at the word of God in First Timothy chapter 5. First Timothy chapter 5, verse 6. But she that liveth in pleasure is dead while she liveth. While she is still moving around, while she is still breathing, while she is still active, while she appears not to have died physically, yet she is living in pleasure, she is dead while she is alive physically. Which means the death we're talking about is separation from God. Separation from the favor of God. And the same death penalty is still there today. In Romans chapter 6 verse 23. For the wages of sin is death. The wages of sin is death. When a child of God, somebody who has been born again, if he goes into sin and he touches sin, and he goes back into doing what he shouldn't do, like committing adultery, committing fornication, people may not know. But the moment that is done, that person has died already spiritually, separated from the Lord. But not only that, there is a second death. That is the judgment that comes upon the people that die physically in sin. Think about it. Three areas, three categories, three aspects of death. Number one, spiritual death. That is separation from God, separation from the life of God. Number two, physical death. That is a separation of the soul from the body. And then, number three, the eternal death, the second death, which is the separation of that man after he has died physically from the presence of God forever and ever. In Romans chapter 1 verse 32. Romans chapter 1 verse 32. Who knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death. Not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. That is, if you sin, or you support sin, or you cover up sin, or you compromise with sin, or you encourage sinning, or you help the people that are sinning to, to commit their sin, and you are backing them and supporting them, you know that those who do those things are worthy of death. Then, and you are supporting them, you are worthy of death yourself. Spiritual death. Then, in Revelation chapter 21 verse 8. But the fearful and the unbelieving and the abominable and the murderers and the mongers and the sorcerers and the idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake with burning with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Which is the second death. I told you earlier that if we have the experiences of the Christian, salvation sanctification i mean baptized in the holy ghost if we have the favor of god the grace of god if we have any relationship with the lord i told you that the way to keep that christian experience the way to keep that favor of the lord in our lives is that we will keep the commandments of the lord if we do not keep the commandments of the lord then we will not remain in the favor of god look at that in the word of god the condition by which we remain in the favor of God in the Christian experiences that we have got in Exodus chapter 19. Exodus chapter 19, verse 5. Now, therefore, if ye will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, then ye shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people, for all the earth is mine. You want to be peculiar in the sight of God? You want to be a treasure in the hand of the Lord. You want to keep the grace and the favor of God upon your life. You see the condition there. If ye will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant. In Deuteronomy chapter 5. Deuteronomy chapter 5. 
reading from verse 29. Deuteronomy chapter 5, verse 29. Oh, that they were wise. Oh, that there was such an heart in them that they would fear me and keep all my commandments always, that it might be well with them and with their children forever. What's the condition that it will be well with us? What's the condition that it will be well with our children? What's the condition that the favor of God, the power of God, the grace of God will continue in our lives? That we have a heart within us. That we fear the Lord, we tremble at the word of God, and we keep all the commandments of the Lord always. You see those words there? Keep all the commandments of God always. Only then it will be well with us and with our children. If we don't keep the commandments of God, then it cannot be well with us. We cannot remain in grace when we are living in sin. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. If we want the grace of God to continue in our lives, then we must make sure that we're keeping the commandments of the Lord, all the commandments of the Lord always. In James chapter 1 verse 25. James chapter 1 verse 25. But you so lookest into the perfect law of liberty, and continuest therein. He be not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work. This man shall be blessed in his deed. And what's the condition of eventually getting to heaven? What's the condition of eventually getting to that eternal city? How can we enter in? In Revelation chapter 22 verse 14. Blessed are they that do his commandments. There's no shortcut. There's no shortcut. If you want to really be blessed of the Lord, you will have to be, you will have to be obedient to the commandments of the Lord. Blessed, blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have right to the tree of life and may enter in through the gates into the city. Verse 15. For without outside heaven, outside the heavenly city, for without are the dogs, and the sorcerers, and the allmongers, and the murderers, and the idolaters, and whosoever loveth and maketh a lie. So then we see the condition whereby we can remain in favor with God, in the grace of God, in the kingdom of God. We see the condition whereby our names can remain in the book of life. Let's go back to Genesis chapter 2. Genesis chapter 2. We now come to the third part. Reading from verse 18. And the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him and help meet for him. And out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every fowl of the air, and brought them unto Adam, to see what he will call them. And whatsoever Adam called every living creature, that was the name thereof. And Adam gave names to all the cattle, and, all, and to the fowls of the air, and to every beast of the field. But for Adam there was not found any help meet for him. Here we see the account of what God has done. That God brought all the beasts of the field, and the fowls of the air, to Adam, to see what he will call them. What a great honor, what a great privilege, what great position God placed Adam as the crown of his creation. So then, Adam gave names to all those creatures. But then, the Bible says, among them was not found any creature, any fowl, any created being that would be suitable, suitable for Adam to share his life with. Now, this shows us very clearly that man is not supposed to have relationship with animals. Man is not to have satisfaction. Man is not to have any pleasure, physical pleasure, from the animals. Because you see, among them, God didn't make anyone to be able to satisfy the need of Adam. God said, it was not good that a man should be alone. And he said, I will make him and help meet for him. This is a section where we consider the man, the woman, and the institution of marriage. This is the account of the Creator's care of man, his fatherly concern 
for the comfort of man whom he had made. He who made man knew both the man and his need. And he knew that it was not good for the man to be alone. Only God perfectly knows our need. And only God is able to perfectly supply all our needs. In him alone is our help. And from him alone are all our helpers. A suitable wife is a helpmate and is from the Lord. That's what God himself said here, that he will make and help meet for him. And he said, I will make and help meet for him. In Proverbs chapter 18, Proverbs chapter 18, verse 22, Whoso findeth a wife, findeth a good thing, and obtaineth favor of the Lord. Whoso findeth a wife, findeth a good thing, and obtaineth favor of the Lord. Concerning what God said, it is not good for the man to be alone. Let us look at Ecclesiastes chapter 4. Ecclesiastes chapter 4, reading from verse 9. Two are better than one, because they have a good reward for their labor. For if they fall, one will lift up his fellow. But woe to him that is alone, when he falleth, for he has not another to help him up. Again, if two lie together, then they have heat. But how can one be warm alone? And if one prevail against him, two shall withstand him. And a threefold cord is not quickly broken. That tells us that marriage was for partnership and for companionship. And so God said, it's not good for the man to be alone. That he will make and help meet for him. Let's come back to Genesis chapter 2. From verse 21. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam and his slept. And he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from the man made he a woman and brought her unto the man. And Adam said, This now is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Here we see the marriage of the first man and the first woman. And then we're told very clearly that the woman was made out of the man. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Verse 8 and verse 9. For the man is not of the woman, but the woman is of the man. Referring to the way the woman was created. You see again, all the parts of the Bible, they confirm what we have in the early chapters of Genesis. Verse 9. Neither was the man created for the woman, but the woman for the man. You see, all this is commenting, interpreting, explaining Genesis chapter 2. Verse 11 and verse 12. Nevertheless, neither is the man without the woman. Neither the woman without the man in the Lord. This is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. That is, they are interrelated. Neither is the man without the woman. Neither is the woman without the man. Even now in the Lord. For as the woman is of the man. Even so is the man also by the woman. And all things of God. In 1 Timothy chapter 2. 1 Timothy chapter 2. Reading from verse 13. For Adam was first formed. Then Eve. You see the expression of scripture? The agreement of scripture? Scripture doesn't contradict itself. When you really study the Bible. When you really understand the Bible. You will see that the Bible is one. There is a unity, there is a harmony, there is a there is complementary coming from one part to the other. So then we see how Adam and Eve were brought together. Now let's go back to Genesis chapter 2 verse 24. Genesis chapter 2 verse 24. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother, and they shall cleave and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. God, causing the deep sleep to come upon Adam, took a rib and closed the flesh in his place. And then God made a woman and presented her to Adam for a helpmate. The wife was made out of a rib 
out of the sight of the man, not made out of his head to rule over him. It is not the will of God that the wife will rule over the husband, nor out of the feet to be trampled upon by him. Also, it is not the plan and the intention of God that the husband will kick the woman, trample upon the woman. But then, you know, God took this rib out of his side to be equal with him, to share life together, co-heirs of the grace of God, of the privileges of life, and under his arm to be protected by the husband, and near his heart to become the beloved of the husband. The wife then is of God's making by special grace and of God's bringing by special revelation and it is that we still need to see today if you are a man you are a new creature make sure that the wife is of God's making by special grace that wife that woman has received the grace of God has become a real child of God and then it's of God's bringing by special revelation God has actually revealed that woman in particular unto you only that can be a real help made to the new creature. We need both prudence and prayer in the choice of such a relationship between husband and wife that is so near and so lasting. He was a good God, a good heart, and a good wife has a good reason to be content and satisfied with God's provision. You see, from the very beginning, God stated and ordained the law of man and wife. God has never changed that law. God's law is as forceful as ever, even today. God made no provision for divorce for Adam. Have you ever noticed that? God made only one woman for Adam, and therefore there was no provision for polygamy, there was no provision for divorce. The bond of marriage is firm, and it's not to be tampered with. It is not to be broken by polygamy or divorce. And the affection between the husband and the wife should not be weakened by friends, by relatives, or by the world. Let's look at Matthew chapter 19. Matthew chapter 19. Reading from verse 3. Matthew 19 from verse 3 to verse 6. The Pharisees also came unto him, tempting him, and saying unto him, Is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for every cause? And he answered and said unto them, Have ye not read that he which made them at the beginning, referring to Genesis again, made them male singular and female singular, one man, one woman, and said for this cause, Shall a man leave father and mother, and shall cleave to his wife, and it way shall be one flesh, wherefore what? Wherefore they are no more twain, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let not man put asunder. Mark chapter 10. Mark chapter 10, reading from verse 6 all through to verse 12. But from the beginning of the creation of God, of the creation, God made them male and female. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife and that twain shall be one flesh so then god so then they are no more twain but one flesh what therefore god has joined together let not man put asunder let not man put asunder and in the house his disciples asked him again of the same matter and he said unto them whosoever shall put away his wife and marry another committed adultery against her. And if a woman shall put away her husband and be married to another, she committed adultery. Romans chapter 7. Romans chapter 7, verses 2 and 3. For the woman which has an husband is bound by the law to her husband so long as he liveth. But if the husband be dead, she is loose from the law of her husband. So then, if while her husband liveth, she be married to another, she shall be called an adulteress. But if her husband be dead, she is free from that law, so that she is no adulteress, though she be married to another man. 
in Malachi chapter 2. Malachi chapter 2 from verse 14 to verse 16. Yet ye say, Wherefore, because the Lord has been witness between thee and the wife of thy youth, your very first wife, against whom thou hast dealt treacherously, yet is she thy companion, yet is she thy companion, although you have dealt treacherously, although you have been unfaithful, although you have even tried to kick her out, yet she is thy companion, the wife of thy covenant. And did not he make one? Yet at he, the residue of the spirit, and wherefore one, that he might seek a godly seed. Therefore take heed to your spirit, and let not deal treacherously against the wife of his youth. For the Lord, the God of Israel, says that he hateth putting away. God hates divorce. God hates remarriage. You kick away your wife, or you put away your husband, you marry another, God hates it. Verse 16. For the Lord, the God of Israel, saith that he hateth putting away, for one covereth violence with his garment, says the Lord of hosts. Therefore take heed to your spirit, that ye deal not treacherously. Let's go back to Genesis now, Genesis chapter 2. The Lord has taught us a lot today. And as you have looked at this whole chapter, you have seen and you have been enlightened on the Sabbath of rest. After God has finished all the creation, you have seen how man was formed by the very hand of God. And how man became a living soul. You have seen the provision of the Garden of Eden. Because God was concerned for the comfort, for the care, for the convenience of man in his innocence and perfection. And how God created the woman and God brought this woman to the man and the first marriage was consummated. And then God gave the institution of the marriage ordinance. Now, what I want you to notice as we now close uh, before we pray is that today you will see that in chapter 2 where we have read. You will see that there is a progression. There is a greater revelation of God unto us. You see, I pointed out to you in chapter 2 that God dominates chapter 1. I mean, when I treated chapter 1 with you last week, I pointed out that God dominated chapter 1. And I will find God, God, God all the time in chapter 1. And that the name of God used there is Elohim. And it's in the plural. Now we have today the name the Lord with capital letters. Look at the latter part of verse 4. That the Lord God made the earth and the heavens look at verse 5 the middle of verse 5 for the lord god had not caused it to rain upon the earth look at verse 7 and the lord god formed man out of the dust of the ground verse 8 and the lord god planted a garden eastward in jo in uh, eden verse 9 out of the ground made the lord god to grow every tree that is pleasant to the side and then as you go on as you go on to verse 15 you will see the lord god took the man and put him into the garden of eden to dress it and to keep it verse 16 and the lord god commanded the man and in verse 18 and the lord god said it is not good that the man should be alone i will make him an help meet for him verse 19 and out of the ground the lord god formed every beast of the field and then verse 21 and the lord god caused a deep leap to, to fall upon adam verse 22 and the rib which the lord god had taken from the man made he a woman and brought her unto the man and you will see all through uh, this chapter that the emphasis is not just on God alone. There's a new revelation of God made in that chapter. And it is uh, with the use of the word Jehovah. That means the God of power, the God of grace, the God of love, the God that provides all things for us. Today, God has revealed so much to us again. And we thank him because of the revelation he has made unto us. Have you known God more today? Have you seen God more today? Have you seen the death of his word? 
and the word he had given to us. And you remember his commandments and the condition of keeping the blessings of the Lord in our lives? That if we will keep the commandments of the Lord indeed, then shall we be peculiar people in his sight. It's time now to rise up and pray unto the Lord. It's now time to bring all that we have learned before the Lord again. And see what he has taught us. See what we have learned. And say, Lord, I thank you. Bring all these things to the Lord point by point. Do you observe the day of the Lord to rest and to worship? Do you look over all the work of the week and then receive more grace on the Lord's day so that you can face the coming responsibilities? Do you know that even though God rested from the work of creation, is still at work today? Still working in your heart? Still working in your life? Are you allowing God to finish what he has started? Call upon the name of the Lord. This work of grace you have started in me. Continue, O Lord, until you perfect it. Are you yielding your body and your soul unto the Lord? Because actually they belong to the Lord. Are you working with your hand? Are you a lazy man, a lazy woman? God commanded that man, though innocent or perfect, that he should dress the garden and keep the garden. He gave him work to do. Are you faithful in doing and accomplishing all the responsibilities God has given you in life? Are you keeping obedience to the word of God, knowing that the favor of God, the grace of God in our lives can only be kept by obedience to the word of God? Implicit obedience, unquestioning obedience, willing obedience. If you have not married, are you going to allow God to work in the person you want to marry and to bring that person by revelation unto you? If you have married, are you praying to God to keep you faithful? That you'll keep to that wife and that wife alone. That husband and that husband alone. The first man, the first woman you ever got married to in your life, that is your real wife and only wife until death do you part. Pray unto the Lord today that he will give you grace to be obedient to all that you have learned. Keep on praying. Don't let anything hinder you. Pray in all the truth, all the message of the word that you have heard today. 